Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council who was himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph brought a linen of cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Folks, before we continue, we have a full house, and there are some people in the back who need seats. So what I would ask is if there are some open spaces in your pew, would you scoot inward so that people can fill in on the edges? Thank you so much. We'll give you a minute. St. John Shuffle. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Let us continue. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, 
Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, and he has said, as he has said, Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. Please stand.
may be seated and good morning. Welcome to Easter Sunday services. If there are still some people in the back who are looking for seats, there are some right here in the front rows. I know it's the least Methodist place to sit in the whole room, but there, are, there is seating available there if you would like it. Welcome to Easter Sunday services here at St. John's United Methodist Church. I'm Josh Corey, the senior pastor. It's a blessing and it's a privilege to uh, celebrate this day with you. I was telling Molly, the, our, our associate pastor, that um, there are just some days where you feel so lucky to work here, and this is definitely one of those days, and so we, we are so happy to have you here today. As we get started, there are just a few brief announcements that we want to lift up. First of all, after this service in our Family Life Center, there is an Easter lunch that is being provided, and you're welcome to attend. Um, it will include some slow-roasted chipotle honey ham. That's pretty good. So... Uh, join us for that. It's going to be it is going to be a delicious meal and a good time of fellowship as well. Also, on April 21st, we are having a special concert here with the Grammy-nominated a cappella group King's Return. Those tickets are, in, are are on sale now at musicatstjohns.org, and you should definitely uh, come and, and join us for that. They'll also be leading our music at 11 o'clock that Sunday as well. And finally, if you're new to St. John's, we just want to lift up to you that there is a class. Uh, called Orientations, which helps you learn a little bit about St. John's. And, and whether you just joined or maybe you're thinking about joining the church or, or just kind of new and, and trying to learn more, uh, we hope you'll sign up for it. It's a four-week class, and the signups are available at the Hospitality Center when you exit today. With that, those are the announcements for today. So let's go to God in prayer as we, we begin this time of worship together. Let us pray. Loving, powerful God, Joy floods over our souls on this day. Christ is risen. Fear is vanquished. Open our hearts and our spirits to receive fully the joy which has been given for us. Let us celebrate the victory of Christ and the hope for the future. Amen. said, Amen. Will you stand as you are able and join in the Apostles' Creed? It can be found on the screen or number 882 in your hymnals. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. 
On the third day, he rose again. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Folks, I'd like to welcome up uh, the Wilborn family for a baptism today. All right, just come right in here. Okay, now I feel like I have the luckiest job in the world, for sure. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. And all of this is God's gift offered to us without price. So today I'm very happy to present Brielle, Simone, and Embry Rose Wilborn for Christian baptism. And so I have, we have some questions for you, Molly and I. We're going to make you go back and forth. I don't know which one is good cop and which one is bad cop, but um, we'll, see, we'll see what the responses are. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness and reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin? Yes. Yes. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you accept, excuse me, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ is open to people of all ages, nations, and races? <laughs> that one you even answered under duress. That's pretty impressive, so... And we have a couple questions for you, the congregation. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? We do. Will you nurture one another in Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness grow in their service to others, we will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. Yeah, you can pour it. Go ahead. We're going to say a quick prayer first. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. We're so close. We're so close. His glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and those who receive it, to wash away their sin and clothe them in righteousness throughout their lives, that dying and being raised with Christ, they may share in his final victory. All praise to you, Eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. All right. You have been so good at...
Are you ready to be baptized? Yay. All right, here we go. All right. <clears throat> Brielle Simone, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And Embry Rose, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. May the Holy Spirit work within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect in them love. And their response, uh, you can say, will be on the screens. We give thanks for all that God has already given you. Well, let's keep going. We're past that. <laughs> Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as members of the family of Christ. All right, we have some things for you. Here are some certificates of baptism for both children. And this is a Bible. And it tells all the stories of God. Can you share this with your sister and tell her the stories from it? All right. That's good enough for me. There you go. All right. All right. Let's give, let's welcome our new family. Thank you, guys. Yeah. So our next scripture reading comes from the prophet Isaiah, the 25th chapter, verses 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation.
Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, you have walked patiently with us throughout our Lenten journey. You've celebrated our successes and our growing understanding of your love, and you have mourned our failures and rejections of your healing mercies. This day, as we have gathered to celebrate the joy of Easter, let us remember that we are to become Easter people, people of the resurrection, people who know that what was thought to be impossible has been conquered. Forgive our stubbornness and fears. Fill, our healing, fill us with your healing love and help us to become the disciples that you need to serve in this world. For we ask in the name of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.
People of God, it is a good and joyful thing to return our gifts of time and talent and treasures to the God who has given everything. After our prayer for the offering, if there are children from kindergarten through fifth grade, our director of children's ministries, Angela, is waiting at the back of the sanctuary and you may go to children's church if you'd like. Let us pray. God of the victory of life over death, on this glorious Easter Sunday, we rejoice in the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. Just as the women encountered the empty tomb and the angelic message of new life, we too encounter the living Christ in our hearts and lives. As we come to present our tithes and offerings, may they be an affirmation of our search for the risen Christ, the one who challenges us to see beyond our own expectations. Bless our giving and help us discover the transformative power of the living Jesus in our lives. In the holy name of our risen Savior, we pray. Amen. Oh, <laughs> 
may be seated. And will you join me in prayer, giving first a moment of silence to lift up the joys and concerns of our own hearts. O oh God of power and majesty, of the glorious expression of music, with the rising of the sun, you have raised Jesus Christ and delivered him and us from death's destruction. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We repeat our Easter shouts of surprise and joy again and again for news of your victory over the powers of death and evil is news so startling, so amazing, so different from the news that bombards us day by day. You surprise us again and again with resurrection life, bringing grace and hope and joy. We thank you this day for loyalty and the love of family and friends, for the newborn and the newly baptized, and for those whom we have loved who are now in your home eternal. We thank you for the renewal of nature in our world and the continuing witness of the Church of Jesus Christ and this congregation of your faithful followers. We bring to you our prayers for this world in need of resurrection. Especially we pray for nations and peoples in strife, for the poor and impoverished at home and abroad, for those we know who are in particular circumstances of distress or disease or dying, for all who follow the risen Christ. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who prays with us this day, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning again. Our second scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John, a familiar Easter story. Uh, but listen to it and try to find something that you hear new for the first time. Hear these good words. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. They were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she went over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know 
that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said, that he had said these things to her. This is the good news of Jesus Christ, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, and, and there's, a, there's a reason that we don't see in black and white. We are meant to see color and appreciate all the beauty of it, and all the beauty that it shows us, the, the world around us, the orangey, rich, red sunsets, to the colors of, of Golden Canyon walls, to the blue of the ocean, to so much more. It's all there for us to re- admire. And not just because God gave us this world rich with with beauty and color and creation, but also because God gave us photoreceptors in our eyes. Humans are born with three types of photoreceptors that can see three different colors. Anybody know the three colors of photoreceptors we have? Give you a hint, RGB. (laughs) Molly knows she was in the 815 service, choir knows. Um, Red, green, and blue. Uh, Those are the colors that we can see because we have those three kinds of uh, photoreceptors, or you you also heard them called cone cells, and they allow us to see those colors. And our eyes combine all of the different shades of those colors, of red or green or blue, to see every color in our world. Everything you see right now, the color of the carpet, the colors of all the clothing that everybody wore today, the the hues of the stained glass and all the different uh, colors and and tones there. If you go later to an Easter egg hunt and see all the wacky zany colors that they dye Easter eggs this year um, or lately, all of those are shades and varieties or combinations of red and green and blue. With our our three photoreceptor varieties, we can see up to 100 different shades of those three colors. So if you take 100 times 100 times 100, that means we get in our, with with the gift of our eyes to see over a million different colors that we can tell one from another. But here's what I love. Some animals have photoreceptors that go beyond the three that we have. They have fourth and fifth ones, especially birds, lots of birds. Sparrows, for example, have four or five photoreceptors. Photoreceptors for ultraviolet light. So if you see sparrows in the sky, or I'm told even chickens have this, makes Kind of ticks you off that chickens can see colors you can't see, right? But it makes us humble. But they can see light and therefore can see colors that you and I have never, not, not only never seen, but probably never even imagined or thought of. And for birds, this can be a good thing. It's, you know, it's kind of an evolutionary trait. They can maybe pick out predators as they're flying through the air or if they need to find a good place to land. They, they, they have this gift. But it's, not, it's also fun to think about, like when you see a rainbow up in the sky, we've seen some really brilliant ones the last few weeks as we've had rain. Um, you, you can see all of those additional layers, the Roy G. Biv colors that are part of our color palette, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. That was not in the notes. Um, <laughs> But if you're a sparrow or a chicken, you can see the ultraviolet. You can see more of the rainbow than we humans can see. I like to think about that, that, that chickens can see colors we've never even imagined. I, and, and, and don't worry, if, if, if you see some chicken looking at a rainbow smugly, enjoying colors you can't enjoy, you can kill them and eat them. And that's, that's because there's balance in nature. So... There are trade-offs, but my, <laughs> but my favorite animal, and not just because it has amazing eyes, but there's so many things amazing about this animal. You should go home and read about them or watch a, a video about them. 
um, mantis shrimp, which live off the coast of Australia and in areas around Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. Uh, among many amazing feats that they can do, mantis shrimp don't have three photoreceptors, don't have four color photoreceptors or five. They have 16 different color photoreceptors, meaning that they can see hues and colors that are light years beyond what we can even imagine. I'm amazed at the gift that vision is, at what we can see and what we can't. I think John, by the way, the gospel writer, was amazed by it too because he talks about light and darkness in ways that go beyond just what time of day something happens that's often metaphorical. Um, and I'm amazed by the gift of vision because um, vision helps me to see where my own blind spots are sometimes. It was about 15 years ago that I noticed that my vision, which I always claimed was a perfect 2020, was suddenly getting just a little bit fuzzy. And fuzzier and fuzzier as I went along. I didn't like this. I was disturbed to think that this was happening, that I was aging and my eyes couldn't see the way they used to. Uh, but I'm also incredibly vain, so I decided just to ignore it because there was no way I was wearing glasses. It wasn't until about 2011 uh, when I was, of course, going to get my driver's license. And the person at the desk, uh, and I don't know if you know this, but some of the most gifted and trained mental health workers in the world uh, work at the MVD and they help <laughs> delusional people understand things that are part of their life now. And one of these saints sat me down at the MVD in 2011 and explained to me that I needed glasses. And when I got them, it was an amazing world that I got to see. This amazing world that we live in, I could see things I hadn't seen in years. It was the first time in my life that I understood what was so great about high-definition television. I, 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 I called one of my friends, and I was like, you can't believe this. I'm watching TV, and I can see the pores in the person's face that's on TV. And she was like, yeah, I know. I've had that for 10 years now. Welcome to <laughs> 21st century, Josh, but um, good you made it. Or it's not just what we can't see. I think sometimes it's interesting what we won't see. I mean, how many of us, we, we can be honest about this, how many of us when we pull up to a light, a uh, traffic light, and there's someone panhandling on the median just to the left of us, all of a sudden we get a blind spot right there. And I do this too. I'm not criticizing and I'm not saying we should, you should give money. That's a personal decision. Maybe it's the best way to help. Maybe it's not. But, but it's just amazing how... Sometimes we have a really good way of seeing those things we don't want to see. It doesn't involve our photoreceptors. It's just what we won't see. So to me, it's not surprising when we read the gospel accounts of the resurrection that everyone is really slow to recognize Jesus. You see it from the beginning to the end of the story. The women arrive at the tomb and they know something's wrong, but the sun's not up yet. So uh, they, they run and get the disciples. The disciples hurry back out to the tomb. They're amazed at what's happened, but they're also basically confused about what's happened. Um, they can't really tell what's going on, can't see what's going on. Right after this text uh, that we read this Sunday comes the, you know, the Doubting Thomas text, where Thomas had one bad day where he said, I won't believe it unless I see it, and we're still picking on him for 2,000 years later. Um, kind of famous last words moment for Thomas. And then, of course, primarily in this story, we see Mary, who is just about waist deep in a conversation with Jesus, but she doesn't see him or won't see him and will not recognize him, just takes him for a gardener. It's the things that we won't see, that we're not willing to see, that can trip us up sometimes. Now, of course, Mary isn't going to notice that it's Jesus. She's come to mourn, and yet it's Jesus who is suddenly alive again. And she's a reasonable person. She's a smart person. And you know the thing about bodies? They don't come out of the grave that much. I only know one or two times. She knows that. So when one does, even if it's the person she has been devoted to, even if it's the person she has followed for years, she doesn't recognize him. And you know what? Give her a break because you and I would do the exact same thing. And I think that's the tension in our world. It's that... It's, it, it's the things that we will not see sometimes. Uh, I don't know if you, anybody know who Barbara Corcoran is? She's the woman who's on um, Shark Tank and, and is a real estate mogul um, investor. She, she talks about real estate and she said once 
that buyers, when they walk into a house, they know within eight seconds whether they want to buy that house or not. It doesn't matter what they see after that. There could be a magic door that leads to a world of wonder where candy grows on everything, but no one ever gains weight and money flows like rivers. But if they didn't like the tile or thought the tile in the entryway looked dated, then they don't really care after that what's in the house. If that's true, we can't really look down and smirk at Mary or the others when they don't instantly see who Jesus was or know what's going on. They stop seeing and start assuming because all of us do that. This is why it's so hard for us to see God in our midst today. It's not just a problem for pre-modern people. We are great at looking right past the presence of God in our world today, and God's presence is everywhere. What I want you to consider today is resurrection, the promise of life, the idea that goodness and mercy are sown into our world in ways that we fail to recognize. The power of God. It's not just an Easter thing. It's in the world all around us. We don't even have to conjure it up. As beautiful as this service is, I think the sermon will be okay too. Uh, as, as great as, as, as worship can be, it doesn't compare to the ways that God bathes our world in resurrection day in and day out. We just have to be like Mary and the other women and alert and help alert other people to see what's happening. The, I, I love what the Brazilian novelist Paulo Coelho write, wrote. You can become blind by seeing each day as a similar one. Each day is different. Each day brings a miracle of its own. It's just a matter of paying attention. And there's so much to pay attention to because it turns out God liked the resurrection and God has a way of bringing echoes of the resurrection to our attention if we will just see it. It's right in front of our faces. I love what uh, Anne Lamott writes. She, she's remember, she remembered something that her grandson taught her once. Uh, her grandson, Sam, and, and she writes, when Sam was six or so, he explained to me why we call God, God. It's because when you see something that is just so amazing, you can't help but just say, God. She continues, I wrote God over and over when I went to New York for the first time and when I saw a bay in Mexico that seemed like it was just carpeted with dolphins. I said God at my own house when a family friend, a man of 80, recited T.S. Eliot's The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, One Drunken Evening with 20 Friends. It can take us a moment to recognize and to see, but the resurrection shimmies all around us every day. Mary was wise enough and indeed aware enough to be able to see it full on when she chooses to see it. Can that be our mission too as an Easter people? Can our mission be to help people see God's goodness and mercy as it exists so close all around us? There's, there's this Celtic prayer. I, I, I love it. And, and I'm sure some of you know it. It's, it's well known. It says, Christ within me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I rise. I just want to suggest to you, whether you're a regular here every Sunday or you're part of the Christmas Easter group or, or maybe you're here because you're, you want, someone dragged you here and, and you didn't want to hurt their feelings. I don't know, but wherever you are coming from, I just want, you to, suggest, I just want to suggest that what the resurrection really means is that God's goodness might be all around us every day. You just have to see it. There's, um, there's this icon. You can see it on the screens. Uh, we, we don't do icons very much in the Protestant tradition, but, but uh, our brothers and sisters in the Catholic tradition and the Eastern Orthodox tradition, they know how to draw icons and, and make these uh, beautiful representations. And when you look at them, what, what the idea is, is it's supposed to be like a picture window that you can look through to see heavenly realities, to see the world that we miss sometimes, but it's God's world and it's all around us too. And I love this one. It was sent to me by a pastor friend of mine, Robert Pelfrey, last year. And it's kind of hard to see, especially if you're not close to a screen, uh, what's happening. So let me just tell you what's happening there. This is supposed to be during that period between Jesus' death on Good Friday and resurrection on Easter Sunday. And so he's down in the underworld and he's causing a commotion. These people off on the sides, they're very upset with Jesus right now because he's messing with the underworld. He's like a bull in a china shop. He's pushing things over and causing a commotion. He's taking the devil's stuff and breaking it. 
He's messing with stuff, and he's also busting open caskets. Those people that you see that he's reaching for and pulling them up out of these boxes, that's supposed to be Adam and Eve that he's pulling out and welcoming them back into life, undoing the effect of sin. And folks, if you're really lucky, we, we, we get to see how good Jesus is at that stuff long before we're laying on our deathbeds. My friend Elise will tell you that she knew this reality because she knew that her, her addictions were completely out of control. Because even when she tried to feel like she was in control, it felt more like being in a coffin than being alive, by her description. And she'll also tell you that it was the grace of Jesus that pulled her out and welcomed her to resurrection at the age of 34. That seeing Jesus created a huge mind shift for her, from thinking that God wants our happy chatter and our performative demonstrations, to just feeling quiet gratitude, humbly, without shame for having been so blessed. Turns out it's not that hard to see the resurrection when we want to, when we're looking for it. Folks, we have to show the world that as well. And I don't know that cheap plastic eggs or chocolate bunnies will do the trick. So can we go from this place as an Easter people? We don't have to be miracle workers. We just have to help people see God's goodness and the ways it ebbs and flows all around us every day. Tomorrow... The world will move on. They will put the marshmallow chicks in the bargain table at the grocery store. They'll take the lavender and yellow crepe paper and that fake plastic grass off the shelves. They'll start making room for Mother's Day mugs and gifts for the graduates. Our retail culture is like an impatient waiter whisking our plate away before we've even had a chance to really enjoy the meal. We don't get much time to savor Easter on the outside. The only option we have is to take the miracle of Easter, the goodness of resurrection with us from this place into our lives and observe it. Church makes it a little bit easier because we have 50 days of Easter before we hit Pentecost, but, but even that's not enough. It makes me so glad that God is so much better at this than we are. Because what does Jesus tell Mary Magdalene at the end? I'm ascending to my Father and to my God. That's only half of it. He says, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So if nothing else today, please see that, that God's love is for you, that God's resurrection is for you. Just see it, because it is really there and it's close. So let us pray. Gracious God, would that we could be among those witnesses. Maybe we wouldn't have recognized you right away either. But help us to recognize you now and to see you in this place and in our homes, in our families, among our friends, among the rejected. Help us to see the places where you're calling to us with the message of resurrection. Amen. I'm not sure I can add anything for the call to Christian discipleship, but as Easter people, there are so many ways we can meet the needs of the world. One of the ways, or one resource that you can find is our newsletter, which is called The Disciple. And you can get it online in your mailbox, every email box every Friday, or there are copies in the narthex. There are classes and studies to strengthen our faith. There are mission and, and serving opportunities in our community and ways to give to meet the needs of our world. And so as Easter people, let us step forth in faith to serve the God who loves us so well.
take this Easter hope with you, not just for yourself, but share it with others. Because the hard truth is, is that we church folks have failed people. We've taught so many people that God's family is a big one, but it's not an ever-growing ever one or an expansive one. And we've told so many people that God's family doesn't have a place for them. And shame on, that, on us for that. So go forth to tell people that Christ's love is for all people. Christ's resurrection is for all people because God is for all people. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.